Hello, uh, thank you for joining my talk on functional programming with Go. So a little bit about me. I am uh, Dylan Mayus. If I'm on a certain platform like GitHub, you can find me with at Dylan Mayus. I'm currently working as a tech lead for Deploy, where we are building a machine learning deployment platform and we're using Go as the main backend language. Of course, I love Go and I also love functional programming. And as we are going to see, these two are not mutually exclusive things. So one of these is not like the others. If people are familiar with these languages, one that might stand out is Go, because the others are more obviously functional languages. Now, when people think of functional programming, there's a few things that tend to come to mind. So first of all, they might think of the declarative nature of functional languages. So you're going to say what you want from a function, but you're not going to say exactly how. So rather than writing a for loop and iterating over every variable, you might just say filter the variables for me. You have first class functions. It's uh, yeah, kind of in the name of functional programming, but functions are going to take center stage. They might think of pattern matching if they've used a language like Haskell before where you can use it heavily. Um, and they might think of the idea of pure functions and the concept of purity. And they might also think of immutability. Now, there's many more things that people think about depending on which uh, functional language they've seen before or which one they've used before. And to a large degree, the ones that I've mentioned here are all possible uh, in Go, with the exception of pattern matching. Pattern matching is not really possible in Go at the moment. But there's also some misconceptions that I want to highlight. So one being that they equate the idea with functional programming to the syntactic sugar that those languages have for certain concepts. For example, people might say you can't have lambda expressions in Go. And what they really mean is that you don't have the lambda syntax in Go. So you don't have the arrow syntax that is quite commonly used. And so that's true, but the syntactic sugar is not necessary for many of the things that we'll see. They might think of functional programming as something complicated. Uh, I think that's mostly due to people seeing object-oriented languages first and learning functional languages uh, second or much later. So when you learn a functional language, You've already been doing object oriented for a decent amount of time, let's say, and you get kind of set in the way of object oriented programming. So it's kind of like starting over from scratch, which might make it look complicated. Uh, they might think you can never have any side effects and get stuck in how to deal with this. Um, and that's not the case. Uh, if a language would have no side effects, it would not be a very useful language. If you want to show the user some output or you want to take some input from the user, you're going to use side effects. Now, most functional languages have their own way of dealing with this. Um, but in Go, we don't have to worry about that that much. We can just get input from the user. There's, it's OK to have a few side effects. They also might think that there is no real industry use for these languages, that it's mostly academic. Um, and there's actually languages like Erlang that didn't come from the academic world or were mostly used in the industry anyway. So it's not entirely true, even though it is mostly still academic, I think there's also more and more cases of industry using it. And there's of course going to be more misconceptions, but these are some of the main ones I want to highlight. So we can get into why even bother using functional programming concepts in Go. Well, for one, it will lead to safer programs. If you have your functions as immutable functions, they're pure, they're small and self-contained, it's gonna be easier to reason about your code. If it's easier to reason about, you will be able to write better code in a way and safer code. Um, another thing that's usually kind of a selling point is easier concurrency. Mentioning that to a bunch of Go programmers is kind of silly because, well, it's also a main selling point for Go. Yet, if you basically have immutable data, which is core to many functional languages, multiple threads will never modify data of another thread. Uh, 
So it's easier to, to write functional code and to think about it. Um, but indeed, in Go, function, um, concurrent programming is already easy enough. You also tend to get less code, but it's more expressive. So it's not just more dense like Perl might be and also unreadable afterwards, but it tends to be, for example, one line that does a lot of things, but it remains readable. And that's part of being a declarative language. It also tends to be easier to debug and test these programs. Again, because functions are self-contained, uh, relatively small, no side effects, you can test each function in isolation and see that it does exactly what you expect it to do. When debugging, you can also debug each function in isolation again and find the issue with one function that's relatively small. So all of this tries to make your code better in a way tries to avoid bugs. But it's also just quite fun to use functional programming. But that last one might be a bit of a subjective thing. So assuming that by now I've convinced you that it might be worth looking at functional programming in Go, how do we actually start by going to a functional way of programming? Well, if you've looked for introductions to functional programming, uh, sometimes they can actually be a little bit intimidating. So somebody might tell you, monads are just monoids in the category of end of functors. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that this is a completely useless description of anything functional. You're not going to make a real uh, program with this. And it's also just not necessary for uh, understanding functional programming. So the first concept that I want to focus on in this talk is that code should be declarative, immutable, pure, idempotent, and your functions are going to act as data. Um, we will get into this in the next slides. And we're going to use this to build up to writing more complex functional programs. But this is the basis that I want to highlight. So first of all, we're going to say what we want, but we're not going to say how we want it. So on the left hand side, we have a program that's written in a more traditional Go style. So we have a sum variable and for the range of minus 10 to 10 inclusive, we will iterate through each value for i. Then we take the absolute value of this. And if the absolute value is an even number, we add it to the sum. If we would write this in a more declarative way, we would get something like on the right hand side. So we say, give me an int range of minus 10 to 10 inclusive. Give me the absolute value for each number that you just generated. Then filter it by a certain predicate, in this case, the even numbers. And at the end, give me the sum of all these numbers. So the right hand side is actually valid go, is written using a functional programming library. And that's how you're going to build your programs by chaining together these types of functions. So I also mentioned that they should be immutable. Well, what this means is that, for example, uh, if you have a piece of data called A and you send it to a function lambda, then B is going to come out, but A will remain unchanged inside that function. So on the bottom, if we would call inside the lambda function A dot change name to X, then a would be modified. So that's what we want to avoid. Um, in Go, it's also quite easy by making the distinction between pointer values or just passing it as the struct itself. So we can ensure that there's no state changes to our data. Um, this also means that it's going to be testable and safer for concurrency. So if you look at this at actual Go code, we get, for example, a function on the top left side that's taking a method receiver that's a pointer to person. And this rename function is just changing person directly. So after you call this function, whatever was originally in the name variable is gone. It's going to be overwritten with the new variable s. Now on the top, uh, on the bottom left side, we call the rename function on the normal method receiver of person. And now we're going to also return person. So we're changing the name inside the function still. So p.name equals s. 
and we're going to return the name. Because we didn't pass a pointer, the original value for person is not changed. So this means that we have to reassign it. So on the top right side, actually, you see this reassignment happening. So p equals p dot rename to Seinfeld. So in this way, it tends to become just a little bit more verbose because you have to do the reassignment. But it's something that's um, not uncommon in Go anyway. If you have a slice and you want to append something to the slice, you reassign it to the original slice variable. That's how you keep appending things to it. So in a similar way, you're going to deal with changes to your data. You're going to reassign them at the end of the change. So then we get uh, to the pure functions versus functions that have a side effect. And so on the top left side, it's a completely pure function called greet. You run greet, uh, it says hello plus whatever variable came in, and it doesn't do anything else. It doesn't change the state of anything in either the system or in the incoming variable. Now the second one is actually changing the state of the system around it. So the second function called bad greet is keeping a count of how many times it has been called. So every time you call this function, a side effect happens and the call count will increase. This will make it harder to test this function because if you test it concurrently, for example, across five different tests, you don't know what the output of the call counter should be after your tests. So you cannot call or you cannot test the call counter. You can, of course, in this case, still test that uh, function returns what it's supposed to. In more complicated functions with side effects, even that might change because the output might depend on something in the system that is being modified by other functions. So it can get messy very quickly. But as I mentioned before, side effects are also useful and you actually want them in certain parts of your program. So on the right hand side is part of a um, library that can generate music. And now at the very last statement of this function, the, the sound frames are being written to disk. And that's going to be a side effect. You're changing the state of the system around you. If this program would not do this, it would be a very useless music program because you would never be able to listen to the music that is being generated. So Yes, having pure functions is a good idea. Um, avoiding side effects is also a good idea, but you're going to do this in certain parts of your program. The key is really to isolate the functions that need side effects. Uh, so you can test your whole function that's pure in isolation, and then just the side effect function should be a relatively small part of the whole process, ideally. I also mentioned idempotence, meaning that Every time you call a function with the same input, you get the same output. Um, might sound obvious, but there's actually places where you're going to violate this and it might be useful to do so. Now, first let's take a look at the ideal case. So in the, on the left side, we see the uppercase function, which just returns strings dot to upper of whatever comes in. No matter how many times I call this function, given the same input, it should produce the same output. But if you look at this one, the second function, update, update wants to change a row's last modified uh, content to the current time. So every time you call this function, the last modified will change to, to now. Um, this would be a bit harder to test because you don't know exactly at what time your function will run the test, so exactly what output you should expect for the last modified. Luckily, in this case, we can easily uh, rewrite the function. So we get update2, which takes the row, but it also takes the time as a variable. So in our unit tests, we could actually just send update2 a row and a test timestamp, not necessarily the current time. And then we can test that the modification happens as we expect it. In the real program, you will still want to pass time.now to the update function somewhere because you still want time.now to be present. Uh, again, this is a case of isolating your functions as much as possible, but at some point you will want to pass time.now and thus violate the whole idea of idempotence for that function. Also, if you're building something like uh, games that need um, 
random events happening. If a function is supposed to be random, you're not going to expect the same result every single time you run it. Uh, that would be a bug. Then we also get to the first class functions or the higher order functions. And a very common example is the filter. So a filter function takes an input slice. It also takes a certain predicate and then it returns an output slice with only the elements that match the predicate. So in our case, we can loop through all the incoming strings. If the predicate matches that string, so if the string matches that predicate, we append it to the output slice and finally we return the result. Now we can actually define functions that we can pass to the filter function. So that's where the higher order nature comes in. So here I have defined a function called long, which takes a string and returns a boolean. So it matches our description for the predicate, which is a functional string to boolean. And in this case, we return true if the length is bigger than 10. If you want to call this filter function now in our main function, we can pass long to the filter function. This means that our behavior for the filter function is not going to be always the same. We can change the behavior of the, of the function by changing the predicate. So we can change what we expect the function to do. But the basic idea will still be the same. Iterate over all the variables and append them if the predicate matches. Um, so if you would chain these together, we can start getting more and more declarative code. If you look on the right hand side only, uh, it looks pretty declarative in the main function. On the left hand side, there's still the loops happening. So in the end, um, they will happen somewhere because Go doesn't just automatically make things declarative for us. Another key concept that people might have um, encountered if they've done functional programming before is recursion and tail recursion. Now, it's not like these are unique to functional languages, of course, but they're incredibly common in them. So on the left hand side, we have the normal function for calculating the factorial. And we're at the last line, you can see that we're returning n multiplied pi factorial of n minus one. So it is a recursive call that's happening. In general, you would want to turn this into tail recursion, even in Go, because it will be faster. And the main difference between tail recursion and normal recursion is that the recursive statement is the last thing your function will execute. On the left hand side, we see that the recursive function is the second to last one. So we return the factorial of n minus one multiplied by n and the factorial of n minus one is the second to last call. On the right hand side, then we see that we have a tail fact um, defined and that call in itself is not recursive yet but it's going to call the tail f function and this now takes two variables instead of just one so it's returning sorry it's accepting um, the amount of well the n that we are at at the moment so basically iterating through n and it's also going to accept the current value we already have so inside the function it's building up the result incrementally the last line of the function is returning tail f of um, n minus one and n multiplied by the current value. So the multiplication is happening uh, before we actually do the recursive call. So if we highlight that here, um, we can see on the right hand side that the multiplication happens inside the parentheses. So it happens first, and then we pass this result to the tail function. Now this has certain benefits uh, over normal recursion. So first of all, you get less stack frames that are being allocated. Uh, in Go, this is also going to equate to being faster. So in benchmarks, the right hand side will perform better. But the fun thing is that it could <laughs> eliminate stack overflows, um, but it doesn't in Go because the Go compiler is not optimizing these types of recursion uh, as of now. So in a language like Haskell, you can run this much more safely because the compiler takes care of eliminating those stack frames. So this was a quick introduction to the basic concepts of functional code. And we're going to use these now to create more advanced 
of advanced uh, structures, basically. So the stuff that we're going to take a look at is we're going to look at closures, for which the idea of passing functions along will become important, currying, in which the closures will become important, and we're going to look at some real-world examples of how we can combine what we've seen so far to create code that looks a little bit more functional and also to help in our day-to-day -day code. So the first thing that we will take a look at is closures. Now, um, if you want to define a closure, it is basically at least two functions and the inner function is going to reference variables from the outer function. So on the left side, we get a um, small example of this. We have a function called closure, which takes a string and it returns a string. But inside the closure function, we define a second function called drop, which takes an integer and returns a string. Inside the drop function, you see that we return um, whatever the original string was, starting at index i until the end of the, um, the string. And finally, we're returning drop with uh, five passed to it. But this is kind of a useless example, but it shows that the inner function drop is using something from the outer function. If we then call this function with hello world, we will just see world. Um, so the using closures, we can actually build a different thing called currying. And currying means that our functions are going to only take one parameter but they're going to return another function. And that function in its turn might expect another parameter again. So by chaining these functions together, you can create functions that require an arbitrary amount of variables to be passed to it. So first of all, we'll define a greet function, which takes a prefix and a name string, and is going to return a string. So you see, we just concatenated using the sprintf statement. Um, but now we're going to turn this into a current example. So we don't want to always pass the prefix and the name. So we're going to call a function prefix greet, which takes the prefix and it returns another function. And the function it returns takes a string and returns a string. So you can see that at the inside the prefix greet function, we get a function returned. The function now takes a name as an input and it returns a string at the end. Finally, this function still calls the greet function. So we don't have to completely get rid of this. We can still use these functions. Now to use the prefix greet function in our main method, for example, we, create, we could create two different types of greeting we could create a Spanish greeting and an English greeting. So first we create prefix greet with hola, and then we do the same thing with hello. Now at this point, the variables hola fn and hello fn, they don't contain a result yet. They contain a string, and sorry, they contain a function that is going to return a string, but the function itself will take a new string as input, right? So we basically have, um, split the greet function into a function that defines the prefix and that function returns a new function that asks for the name. So now if we were to um, call these prefix greet function, these prefix greet functions that we've created, hola fn and hello fn with gophers, it will print hola gophers and hello gophers. So using this idea of currying, what you could do is you could create very generic cases like the prefix greet function. But then what you do is you basically um, set certain variables as a, a hard-coded thing almost, right? In this case, we create the hola function. And no matter how many times we call the hola function, it's always going to have the hola prefix. So doing this, we can start seeing that we're passing functions around. We're using functions as kind of data because we're storing them inside our variables. And we also see that we can potentially store them and pass them to different parts of the program. So the OLA function could become input to yet another function. So that would be higher order functions. To highlight it again, um, we only have one parameter going in to the prefix greet and we return another function that also takes only one parameter. Inside, we still call the original greet function, 
So it's just layers on top of it. And on the right hand side, we define our variables, hola function and hello function with hola and hello respectively. So what we've seen so far, we can turn into an actual practical um, use case. We can do something useful with this. So on the top side, you have a function and your IDE tells you it needs an L, P, A, and M. So in typical Go fashion, they don't tell you anything. They're just single letter variables. Now, if you were to actually give them a bit of a more decent name, you might see name, last name, phone, age, and married. So you can figure out this is about person. Um, we basically want to reduce this. So we're going to see that we using the concepts we've seen before, want to create functions that can take less parameters or less variables. And we can uh, even define some default values for them, like you would do in, for example, Python, if you're familiar with that. So to define our example, let's start with um, creating some structs. So first we create a server struct, which takes some options. And options are defined as being either uh, maximum connections, a transport type, or a timeout. So an integer, transport type, and an integer again. We will also define a uh, alias for a function that takes options and returns options. So this function is not going to mutate anything. It's going to apply something to the options, but return a new uh, struct. So that's in line with the idea of keeping everything immutable. So now we can actually define some of these options. So we're going to create a function called maximum connections. It accepts an uh, integer coming in and is returning a server option. Inside this function, we call a function that takes options and returns options. And inside that function, we actually define, or well, we say that the maximum connection should be set to n. So this is the concepts that we've seen before of closures where the inner function uses a piece of data from the outer function. And we're returning a function at the end of it rather than just the result, the resulting options. We can do this for a timeout as well. So for timeout, we could say, give me an n, an integer again, and it will return a server option. It's basically the same as doing maximum connections. We don't return a set result, but we return a function and that function when called will change the timeout to n. If we were to use this in a constructor, we could create a function called new server and we, ta we take any amount of server options. Now inside this constructor, we're going to iterate over all the options that we get. And the options that we've defined on the first line are going to keep being changed by calling this function. Well, they're going to be overwritten, similar to how you append things to a slicing goal. So you call O with the options as an argument and you get a new options out and you reassign it the whole time. Um, so doing this means that the options are basically never being mutated, but we are reassigning them. Finally, we will return a server with these options applied to it. If we, in our main method, create this server, we can pass maximum connections and transport type, for example. So because we accept any amount of server options, we don't have to pass every single variable. So in this case, we decided not to pass the timeout. Because of the default zero values in Go, we can see that the result is eight maximum connections, transport type is set to UDP, and the timeout is zero. Uh, so the zero comes from the default uh, zero values in Go. But we could also think of creating default options in a very similar way. So rather than just having the options inside the constructor defined as the empty struct, we can say the timeout is 1000 and the maximum connections is already set to four, for example. In this way, when we iterate through all the options that are coming into our constructor, we keep reassigning them. But if something is not present, for example, the timeout is not present, it is not overwritten. And we have the 1000 as the default value. So calling this in the server using the, using the exact same line for the constructor with eight maximum connections and a transport type of UDP, we see that the result now shows that maximum connections has been changed. We have set a transport type 
put the timeout is the 1000 that we defined as the default one earlier. So that was all good so far, but now we'll get into actually making it declarative. What we've done up until now still looks pretty much like Go code, although a little bit more verbose at times. Remember that uh, earlier we took a look at how you could filter your data using a filter function, which takes a slice and a predicate, and then it returns another output slice. Uh, and we could pass, or we could create a function called long or long strings and pass this to the filter function, meaning that we can change the behavior of the filter function depending on what we pass it. So that's the basic idea of declarative programming. But we don't have generics yet. So if you want to create a really generic uh, function for filter, well, that's not possible. So we have a kind of flexible predicate, but the input slice will always be a slice of strings. And the output slice will also be a slice of strings all the time. Um, this means it can be a bit harder to maintain because you would have to write the filter function for every type in your program. So you create a filter for strings, then you create a filter for integers, then for person, then for whatever. So without generics, this can become harder to maintain because if you discover you have one bug in your filter function, you have to fix it across all of them, of course. And as I highlighted earlier, you will never be entirely declarative. You will have to hide the loops somewhere in some part of your problem. But luckily there's actually quite a few libraries, uh, some that I highlighted here, that take care of this uh, in various ways. So Gleam uses reflection, and then you have Py and Hasgo, which are code generators. And Hasgo is a project that I wrote. It's heavily inspired by uh, Py that Elliot made. Um, so here I'm going to take a look at Hasgo. And Hasgo makes your functions write in a more declarative style. So it does this by actually generating your functions for any type. So it kind of acts like generics. Uh, the code will be declarative. So as we've seen, it will be um, just using single lines. The code will be pure. So the functions don't have side effects. They're also nil safe, which is quite important. Um, passing nil to it works fine. It just acts like it's a normal input. Um, because if you look at ha languages like Haskell, where the whole notion of being nil is kind of gone. And the code is always immutable. So if you send it data, it will never destroy your data. It will always return uh, a new struct. So to look at a small example, first of all, we have to, of course, import it. Um, in this case, we're importing types, which means the default types for Hasgo. So it understands integers, strings, and booleans natively. And we can create the same function that we saw um, at the beginning of the presentation. So we have a function that takes an int range of minus 10 to 10 inclusive. It then takes the absolute values of them. It filters them by an is even function, returning the even numbers, and then it returns the sum and hopefully the result is uh, 60. So with uh, this library, you're going to be able to chain all your functions together like this. So to highlight it again, we have the int range, then the ABS call, then the filter call, and then the sum. All of these individually might do loops, but they're hidden behind a function call for us. Uh, this also highlights that um, if you have really performance sensitive code, this might not be the best approach, right? So you will have many, many more loops being generated by this approach than if you would write a really small, smart single loop that does all these operations. So the idea of using a library for functional programming should not be performance. It should more be uh, readability of your code. So let's take this idea and apply it to a new type of struct. So something that is not one of the base types defined by Go, no strings or integers. Um, I defined something here called a movie and a type called movies, which is a slice of movie. So in our movie type, we take a name, which is a string. We have an owner, a year, and a certain amount of revenue that we get. So how do we go from having this truck definition to a 
to all the functions that Hasbro can do on them, all the operations that we can use. Well, we add a comment, a special type of comment that tells uh, the Go compiler or well, the Go generate tool to generate using the Hasbro program. It requires a certain type. So our type is movie in this case and our slice type is movies. So those are the only two arguments you have to pass to the code generator to generate all kinds of functions for these types. This is, for example, a very small part of what is being generated. So we have, um, of course, a statement saying that you shouldn't edit this because it will be overwritten. Uh, if you want to add your own functions or change how they work, we'll get to that soon. But basically don't add, edit this file because it will be gone the next time you generate it. And it generates all the functions. So this is kind of what they look like. So in this file, you will notice, for example, that uh, the types are being used in the functions. So we have a function called all, which takes a slice of movies on the method receiver. It also takes a predicate of type movie. And in the end, it returns a Boolean if any of them match the predicate. So in this way, for any type in your program, you could generate all kinds of functions. The functions are attached to the slice. So the reason we define a slice type called movies in our case is because if you look at these functions, the all and the any function that are visible, they're attached to the slice type. This is necessary because in Go, we do not have a method overloading. So we couldn't call the same function once with the movies type and then again with the person type or whatever. Um, so yeah, they always need to be, sorry, we don't have generics. So we, we actually need to, to always pass the correct type. So um, to build this example out, we have a function just that's called get movies to give an idea of what's going to be in there. We will, for example, have a uh, Star Wars in there. We will have Toy Story in there and many more. The idea is that we're just creating a slice that holds a certain amount of data. And now let's say that uh, for a certain company called Cartoon Mouse, they want to decide which movies they should buy, uh, should buy the rights of. So first of all, they want to define their predicate. When are we going to buy a movie? And they're going to call this making money. So on the top left side, we see there's a function called making money. It takes a movie as some input, it returns a boolean as some output, and it returns true if we earn more than a million. So if we um, if our movies make a lot of money, we want to have the rights. So we want to become the owner. Then we have a function called buy rights. And here we see that it takes an organization as some input. It returns another uh, movie struct, which is the, the slice of movie as an output. And here you see how it kind of happens declaratively. So first we say filter all the movies by making money. So we have gotten a slice of movies and then call the filter function, only the movies that make money, defined as whatever is in making money, are going to be returned. And then we call something called nub, which basically means give me the unique ones. Um, I'll get into why it's called nub in five seconds. <laughs> then we say take two of them because we don't want to spend all the money buying, buying rights to movies. So just take two of these and then uh, map them. So the map function takes some input it modifies the input and returns a changed version. The original input is not modified, right? So it stays immutable. The map function takes a movie, returns a movie, but it's changing the owner to the organization that came in from by rights. And at the end, we return the result. Um, so some things to mention here, the naming might look a bit strange. So the library uh, is using code generation to create these generic functions that operate on slices. And the functions are all based on Haskell. So the way it's named in Haskell is most likely with a few exceptions, uh, the name in Hasgo. Something else to mention is that the map function, we are again, a little bit constrained by what we can do in Go. You can only map between the same type. So you can map from movie to movie by default, and you can change what uh, the movie variables look like, but you cannot, for example, map from movie to person and then continue as a person. Uh, to do this, you could actually change the map code yourself as we will see in a second. 
But first, um, there's actually a lot of functions in this program that are being generated. So here, I'm just showing a bunch of them on screen. On the screen. Uh, so all the functions you see here, well, most of them can be generated for any kind of type. A few of them are specific to a certain type. For example, we have an integer range function. It's quite obviously going to return integers. Um, strings replicate is going to only work on strings. But most of these can be generated for any type you have in your system. So assuming that these functions are not enough or you want to make some changes to it, what does it actually look like to program these kind of generic functions? Well, here's an example of the take while function. So the take while uh, is going to iterate over a slice. And as long as the predicate matches, it's going to append it to the output slice. So it's going to return all elements that match until the first one that doesn't match. As soon as a single element doesn't match the predicate anymore, we return what we have so far. So here we see that the function take while is programmed against something called a slice type. And it takes as input an element type and returns a Boolean. So a predicate function, sorry, that takes an element type and returns a Boolean. And at the end, we return a slice type. So the whole idea of how we write these generic functions is by using something defined as slice type and something defined as element type. Um, the way this works is basically a copy from how Py does it. So the Py library, um, Elliot, came up with this as far as I know, um, and I modified it to make it look like Haskell. But it's basically his idea. Um, and our code generator is going to look for these two defined types, slice type and element type, and replace them with the input from our generating function. So remember the comment, go generate had a minus t variable, which was movie, and a minus s variable, uh, which was movies, so the slice of movie. That information is crucial to replace the correct parts of these generic functions. Uh, so you could add your own. If they're useful and they look like Haskell, you can contribute them upstream. Uh, but you could just make them locally. So having said this, there is actually uh, some potential drawbacks to using this approach of functional programming in Go. So one question to ask is, is it going to be idiomatic Go code? Um, Go is a multi-paradigm language, but if you look at most of the code you see, it doesn't look very functional, as in it doesn't look like a functional language. Um, so if you're the only one on your team doing it, you might want to reconsider, uh, or you might want to isolate it anyway, because of course everybody needs to be able to read the code and understand the code and know what you're doing and you know following the right style guide and everything. So there is indeed a question of is it idiomatic go? Well. Multi-paradigm, so in theory, yes, it's fine. If you're the only one on the team, try to, you know, try to convince the team. <laughs> um, you're also never going to be 100% functional, most likely. Again, because of limits that are just inherent in the language. Uh, we, at the moment, don't have generics. You can use a library to generate functions like the ABS function and take the tails function and, and so on and so forth. But if you write them yourself, a certain part of your code will not be functional. It will be written in the normal uh, iterative way. And as I mentioned, you will have to find a way of dealing with the side effects. Um, at some point, you might want to reconsider for performance reasons. So it's going to be really hard to stay 100% functional throughout your entire program. And indeed, the third point was performance sometimes. One thing I do want to mention, uh, that I've heard people uh, say or ask is that the immutability might uh, actually be bad for performance. So if you want to have completely immutable code, you never pass your pointer. You always just pass the struct as it is um, instead of a pointer to the struct. And then they become a bit worried that, hey, this might actually be bad for performance. I should be passing pointers here. In a lot of cases, that is not true. So. Uh, pointers can be more harmful to performance than beneficial. That's a topic on its own. So immutability will not hinder your performance most likely, but all the, um, the loops that happen in the background might. And finally, there is no syntactic sugar. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, the syntactic sugar is not what makes a language functional. 
but it is kind of what makes the functional language more readable. So uh, some languages automatically do the currying, so you don't see that you're always just taking a function with one argument and returning a new function because the language completely hides that for you. With our syntactic shower, the code can become a little bit more verbose. So yes, uh, it is definitely possible. It can improve your code, but I would advise to use libraries if, you, um, if you're going to use functions like the ones that I've shown earlier for Hasgo. It will just make your life a little bit easier rather than having to reinvent the wheel and re-implement them yourself. So thank you for, uh, for well, watching the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me with Adilan Mays on Twitter, GitHub, Medium, and so forth. Uh, or you can read my blog where I also write about functional programming in Go. Or you can check out the library, uh, use it. Um, if you find some issues, feel free to mention them. Want to add some things, feel free to make a pull request. Uh, all help is always appreciated. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.